uh, for some reason, the last couple of weeks, people have announced I've been saying, hey, how are you doing? Are you okay? Are you I don't know what it was. I even had uh, Todd Wilson sent me a message, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. It says, hey, is everything all right? I said, as far as I know, brother, ain't nobody told me anything otherwise. Why? He said, because I heard you were in the hospital. Unless I was visiting somebody. No, not that I know of, but it, tell me what it is, and by golly, I'll go. I saw a post this week that said uh, the being assigned, being forced to go to a mental hospital for a few days is sounding better and better. Y'all agree with that? Uh, my mind, I joke all the time about my mind is everywhere. In fact, a couple of weeks ago in the newspaper, I even put in there, I wrote the article for the newspapers that I do. I wrote it on the fact that my family has been saying for the longest time I have ADHD. Uh, I can't even know what that means. I'm, can I actually think I do, maybe? Uh, but my mind's all over the place. And uh, a few weeks ago, Holly and I were riding down the road, and she was showing one of those videos of talking about it. The Samantha Ed Center's, hey, this is Dad. <laughs> and uh, they're always joking me, and that's cool. That's cool. I'll joke them back. So anyway, they were talking this, and Holly said, hey, uh, do you ever have, like, uh, voices in your head? And I said, I'm not schizophrenic. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I do. Why? I said, more than voices, I have this constant, like, white noise, and not the complaining ladies in our communities uh, is not what I'm talking about. Oh, that was a bad joke, wasn't it? That was a bad joke, bad joke. Uh, but this constant, like, TV static noise in my head nonstop. And she said, huh. Fellas, if you don't know, if your wife goes, huh, that's usually not a good thing. So allow me this morning as we begin to just give you a day in the life of Cameron's mind. Y'all ready? Y'all might want to buckle up. This is going to be rough. This is going to be good. In fact, I'm not even going to give you the full day. I just want to give you like a three-minute glimpse in the mind of Cameron. Are you okay? And by the way, I actually wrote all this down shortly after I timed myself for three minutes just to say, oh, wow, it might be worse than I thought. So here we go. Three minutes in the mind of Cameron. Here we go. Have I done the bulletins yet? Did I give the songs to everyone? Who's doing communion this Sunday? Did I give those sheets out because I don't want to get fussed out if I didn't? What's the weather going to be like today? Have I taken my insulin? The songs for the Sunday, are they going to be fast? Are they going to drag? What are they going to be like? I really, really could go for a cheeseburger in paradise right now. Man, where is my insulin? Shoot, I got to do the KCC devotion. I got to type up the inside bulletin, type up the outside bulletin, make sure I post the outside bulletin, make sure I get the website lined up. Are the Padres playing today? Man, they've been struggling here. They should have a really good team. And what team? We've been sponsoring the Padres as the church family for years now at Neblet Field. We paid. I think we paid. I gave Glenn to pay. I'm sure Glenn. If I gave it to Glenn, Glenn, Glenn paid for it. I know that. Why didn't they tell us what team do we have? Do we have a team this year? I thought we had a team. And if so, I wish they'd tell us when the schedule is so I could go root for them. What is that smell? The paper devotion. Doggone it. I got to get that done and I have to send that. Did I send last week's? Uh, Stacy didn't call me, so I guess I did. I hope I did. For real, y'all, where is my insulin? I should send this video right here that I just saw to the kids. They would love it. Hey, hey, hey. Chicken in the corn, in the corn pan, mama. I need to get my head checked out. I don't know what's going on. My eyes are blurry. I need to schedule an eye doctor appointment. Wait. You and Holly just went to the eye doctor. Remember, they said everything was fine, but you got to come back in six months just to make sure it's good because you're diabetic and they want to make sure everything's all right. So why is everything so blurry? They said my eyes are okay. Wait, that's just piling. Calm down. Everything's all right. For crying out loud, where's my insulin? Did I take those hippie drugs Holly wants me to take? I don't know why she's got me taking all these things. I don't even know what these hippie drugs do. Beet, ginger, ashwagandha, Wakanda forever, what the crap is called. I don't even know. That ginger gives me indigestion, but I took my indigestion pill, so I should be okay. What's love got to do? got to do with it. Joe Diffie died a few years ago. Did they actually prop him up by the jukebox when he died? That was the only man's desire was to be propped up by the jukebox. I wonder if they did that. Did I miss my turn? And that, folks, is just three minutes in the life of Cameron's mind. Y'all ready to buy tickets to the gun show? It is all over the place. My mind is going non-stop. When you ask, how am I doing? And I laugh, it's because I really don't know. <laughs> I really have no idea. Uh, next week's newspaper devotion, you'll get that if you get the newspaper and y'all read those devotions that I put. It's in the Charlotte Gazette, the KV Dispatch, Gossip Channel, whatever that thing. All those newspaper things that they put it in, I don't have any idea. I just write it because they tell me to write it. So uh, in that one, next week, it starts off just to forewarn you. I forewarned Bernice Thompson because I know she reads them. I forewarned her. Next week, it starts off by me saying, I'm ready to die. Uh, for the last several weeks, I've been telling Holly, I just want to die. I walked in a hospice patient's house this past week, <laughs> and when I did, as soon as I walked in, this little old lady, 87 years old, looks at me and says, Preacher, I'm going to die today. 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 Today's the day. I'm going to die today. 
And she said this about eight times in church, me being the soft, kind, loving man that I am. I looked at her and said, well, good. I'm jealous. Can I be, can it be me instead of you? She shut right up. She shut up. She said, what? I said, I'm serious. I'm jealous. Can it be me? And that's the only way I'm going to catch a break and get a vacation is if I die. So please let me go, and I'm going to make you a bet. Her daughter says, oh, she's been doing this nonstop for the last couple weeks. I said, I'm going to make you a bet. If you go today, if today's the day, awesome. Praise God for that because you're a follower, and that's, this world ain't our home. Paul said to live as Christ, to die as Cain, and he was torn between the two. And I get that, torn between the two. I get it, Paul. So I told this, this lady, I said, ma'am, I'm going to tell you right now, let's make a bet. If you do go today, I need you to ask him to hurry up my paperwork. If you don't go today, then I need you to just hush your face about this and stop talking about it, all right? He'll call you when he's ready. I'm loving. I'm so kind. So good with words. <laughs> ADHD is a beautiful thing. Is it ADHD? Is it just mental overload? Is it a break that's needed? Was I born with it? Or maybe it's just Maybelline. That's how my mind works. I need y'all to be real with yourself. Am I the only one? <laughs> that is a glorious thing right there. I love to hear more people. Nope, mm, nope, you ain't. Man, we, we get so easily distracted. Our mind is all over the place between work, play, family, food, deadlines, calls, texts, emails, and more of the just randomness going on in our heads. We randomly just go, squirrel. Y'all ever seen that movie Up? You had that dog in the movie that was just in there going off and then oh, squirrel and got distracted so easily. My family, ever since seeing that movie, they randomly, when I start talking or Eli starts talking, just randomly, squirrel. I got you. My bad. That, have y'all ever seen Up Dog? Does anything smell like Up Dog? What's Up Dog? Nothing. What's up with you? <laughs> My mind is all over the place. A beautiful legacy, church, has been handed down to us through the generations after generation after generation. And it seems these days we are so busy or we're too busy seeking what we desire and what we want rather than taking the legacy that was beautifully worked hard and handed to us and striving to pass that down to the next generation and the generation after that and even taking that legacy and elevating it to a whole new level for those who come behind us. I feel we have failed the next generation to truly show them what matters and what's important in life. And I say this because I hear my generation and older all the time complaining. You know, when I was growing up, we used to go visit people just randomly. You didn't have to call them because nobody had a cell phone. You just showed up, and you sat there, and you'd talk for hours. You'd make homemade ice cream and have cookouts, and you'd do all this stuff. Man, I miss those days. Time out. Why can't you still do it? Why can't you just randomly show up to somebody's house and say, hey, I just want to check on you. Oh, because people don't like visits these days. You're right. People don't. And if they don't want to visit, you know what I have learned? Hey, I'm good. Can you? We're, just, we're, we're busy right now. That's a good. We're busy right now. Can we just come another time? Why don't we invite people over? Why don't we take people out to eat? Why don't we do this? Church, I'm going to let you know, I don't desire to leave my children a rundown, dead-filled, sad, temple house of a man or a life that they now have to take up and worry about. I want to leave a legacy that is best for my children and hopefully, maybe, possibly one day, their children. The problem is we're comfortable. The problem is we're comfortable, we get comfortable, we get selfish in our journey. We want our way, and we couldn't care less about anything else as long as we get our way. You don't believe me? Uh, I saw this picture a long time ago, and it is oh so true. I will read it to you so you don't have to try to squint your eyes in case you haven't made your eye doctor appointment. It says, hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times. And that describes our country to a T. And I got to be honest, church, it describes my life. My forefathers worked their fingers to the bone to provide for their families. Their families took that hard work and they provided it for their next generations. And so it's gone through years and years. Through the years we have done less and less than my forefathers did and while savoring the past, we're savoring those good times. We remember those moments. Oh, back in the day, this church. 
instead of just savoring the past, instead, we should be building off of their legacy and taking it to a whole nother level. But we've gotten comfortable and we've become complacent. We've become weaker and weaker and times are truly harder than they've ever been. And a lot of my problems, I get so distracted. I get so distracted, whether it's from too many irons in the fire, whether it's from trying to get things done on my own, whether it's not asking for help because help doesn't show up or help doesn't do it, and I got to do it anyway. I just want—I don't want to overload anybody else. It's better for just me to be overloaded than worrying about overloading anybody else. I find myself all over the place, and I find myself struggling at times, jumping from task to task, and my mind is constantly rolling. And we've already agreed I ain't the only one. Sometimes in life, we need to stop and look around us and refocus and try our best to figure out what truly matters and what's of most importance. I I called this message this morning, oh, look, a squirrel, because we get so easily distracted. Our attention wanders and we lose focus on what we're doing and more importantly, what we're supposed, what we're supposed to be doing. And our Christian life, well, It's much the same way. We get used to seeing things the way they are, and we lose interest in making our spiritual life better. Too often, our attention is drawn away from social media, from work, from people around us, from the news, from cell phones, from extra activities, from videos, from trying to make a little extra jingle to have some fun, to even church work can be a distraction. Things distract us, and we take our eyes off of Jesus and the things that he desires. And it was no different it is today than it was 2,500 years ago outside of technology issues in the days of Haggai. The people had returned from exile in Babylon, the foundation of a new temple. It had been laid beautifully, but the work had stopped for 16 years. The people, the leadership, the church had done nothing. We checked out this passage at the beginning and at the end of last week, but I want us to return and really dig in deep. Are you all ready? So Haggai and the Old Testament, the prophet Haggai, we're in that book today. We're going to look at chapter chapter 1, and I want to start off together looking at verses 2 through 11. Let me read it to you. It says, The Lord of armies says this, These people say the time has not come for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. The word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Uh, Is it time for you yourselves to live in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now the Lord of armies says this, think carefully about your ways. You have planted much but harvested little. You eat but never have enough to be satisfied. You drink but never have enough to be happy. You put on clothes but never have enough to get warm. The wage earner puts his wages into a bag with a hole in it. The Lord of armies says this, think carefully about your ways. Go up into the hills, bring down lumber, and build the house, and I will be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. You expected much, but then it amounted to little. When you brought the harvest to your house, I ruined it. Why? Uh, This is the decoration of the Lord of armies, because my house still lies in ruins, while each of you is busy with your own house. So on your account, the skies have withheld the dew and the land its crops. I have summoned a drought on the fields and on the hills, uh, on the grain, new wine, fresh oil, and whatever the ground yields, on people and animals, and on all that your hands produce. There's an old phrase that goes, a life without mission is a life without meaning. Uh, Purpose-driven life author Rick Warren, he tweaked it and wrote it this way. I liked his version better. He says, without God, life has no purpose. Without purpose, life has no meaning. Without meaning, life has no significance or hope. Mm. Fritz Kreisler was an Australian-born violinist and composer who lived between 1875 and 1962, one of the most noted violin players of all time. He's known for a sweet tone and an expressive phrasing in his music. To achieve this success, he described his life mission. Chrysler said, narrow is the road that leads to the life of a violinist. Hour after hour, day after day, week after week, for years I lived with my violin. There were so many things I wanted to do that I had to leave undone. There were so many places I wanted to go that I had to miss if I were to master the violin. The road that I traveled was a narrow road, and the way was hard. 
Chrysler had a mission in life, to become the greatest violinist he could possibly be. That meant he had to eliminate everything else from his life that took him away from that goal. Tiger Woods, in my opinion, my opinion, is the greatest golfer of all time. Do you know what Tiger Woods, back in the day when he was so phenomenal and no one could touch him, do you know what Tiger Woods did on his day off? He played golf. You know why he played golf on his day off? Because he wanted to better his game. He was already great, but he knew he could elevate that legacy to another level and become greater. What was the problem with Tiger Woods' golf game? You ready? He got distracted. Ooh. Ooh, that brings it in, doesn't it, church? Tiger Woods was phenomenal. I mean, sick, nasty on the golf courses. He played golf on his days off, but the problem was he got distracted. As Christians, we're called on a mission as well, and it's much more important than being a world-class musician or being an avid golfer, baseball player, or anything else. We can't be sidetracked by our, any other endeavor or get so easily distracted because life without a mission is life without meaning. God's people from our section in Haggai were getting easily distracted with their personal wants, with their personal desires, and were neglecting God's house and God's family. They were becoming more and more selfish with the me, mine, what I want, what I thinks, that they had completely forgotten about taking care of not only God's temple, but way more importantly, taking care of God's family. They were not taking care of the hearts of God's people. So let's break down this section, verses 2 through 11. Y'all ready? Verse 2 again says, The Lord of armies says this, These people say, The time has not come for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. God's speaking to Haggai, the prophet, right here. Haggai was probably an old man at this point in time. He most likely had remembered the temple in the past before Nebuchadnezzar destroyed it 65 years before this. These people had excuse after excuse after excuse of why it hadn't gotten done. Oh, we're being threatened by the enemies. Oh, the Samaritans are also threatening us. Oh, the Persians, they, they persuaded us. But even Cyrus, King Cyrus, had given them the go-ahead to build the temple. They had been looking out for their own wants, their own desires, their own families, their own houses. I mean, after all, this is important because God wants us to be happy, right? And how can we be happy the way God wants us to be happy, unless we have nice paneled houses, nice clothes, a good social network, plenty of food and drink, and fun with our friends. <laughs> it's an interesting choice of words that God uses here. He says, this people says, instead of what these people say, instead of my people say. His people were not doing what he called them to do, so God is not so quick to claim them as his own. We get this, right, parents? Your child does a great job. I mean, they hit a home run. They hit the game-winning basket. They, uh, they're playing the instrument for everybody. They sing so beautifully. They're good in good grades. They're doing so good. And what do you do, parents? That's my boy. That's my girl. Look at them. That's my kid. As soon as they do something that they shouldn't be, as soon as they embarrass you, as soon as they're failing or doing horrible, whose child is it then? Hers, right? Yeah, they get everything bad from their mom. We know that. Amen, church. We know this. Don't laugh too hard, guys. You have to go home with her, not me. We all know, though. <laughs> if they're doing great, oh, that's my kid. But if they're not, ain't mine. I don't know whose that one is. We ain't found out that we ain't gotten the blood test on that one back yet. <laughs> the dumb jokes that we make. You know, guys, they're figuring this the same way. Jesus commented in Luke chapter 6 saying, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? Read that again there, church. Read that again. Let's get real. If we're God's people, we ought to be doing what God's called us to do. Amen? Mm, that was quiet. If we're God's people, we ought to be doing what God's called us to do. Haggai then brought the word from God to the people. In verses 3 and 4, he says, The word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. It is a time for you yourselves to live in your paneled houses while the house li this house lies in ruins. You see, the people had gotten sidetracked. They had gotten distracted and to doing things that they wanted instead of doing what God had called them as his people to do. And that day and time in the Old Testament, the temple is the symbol of God's relationship. Yahweh was calling you to the temple to worship as a family. 
the temple was way more than just some building. It's where you met with God. But for these folks here, there's no urgency in that. We're not worried about it. We don't really need to meet with God. We're okay. We're doing okay on our own. And when we read how God calls out their paneled houses, it means that he's talking about the, making their houses more elegant, usually very costly materials, while the temple, while the temple, his house, lie in ruins, lay in ruins. The question here is one of uh, our priorities. God is asking them directly, what's more important here, my house or your house? But apparently this wasn't important to the people. They were expressing spiritual apathy, and now God is rebuking them for their selfish indifference. In verse 15 again, we see now the Lord of, Almighty, Lord of Armies says this, Think carefully about your ways. Did you know this phrase here about God calling them to think about, to evaluate themselves, to think about their ways, is mentioned five times in this short two-chapter book. Just two chapters. Chapter one, chapter two is it for Hagar. Five times God is asking them, think about what you're doing. Think about what your ways. Think about your thoughts and your actions. Think about yourself. Church, I call that divine chastising. In verse six, he says, you have planted much but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough to be satisfied. You drink, but never have enough to be happy. You put on clothes, but never have enough to get warm. The wage earner puts his wages into a bag with a hole in it. Can you feel God's disappointment in them? And that's the worst thing to tell. It's not, I'm mad at you. No, I'm not mad at you. What's the worst thing anybody can ever tell you? I'm disappointed. Oh, that'll break your heart, won't it? It's not, I'm mad at you. I'm, I'm disappointed. Oh. Uh. God is letting them know, hey, guys, I'm just disappointed with you. I want you to know how closely I'm watching you and what I know that you're doing, your actions and your lack of actions, when you're still claiming to be a follower of mine. Imagine not only what the people are thinking when they hear this, imagine what the leadership is going through in their minds, because they're the leaders. They're the ones who are called not only to live right themselves like everyone else, but they're actually called to hold everyone in the family accountable. That scripture tells us time and time again that the leaders will be held to a higher standard for the way they love, lead, and guide the family. So imagine with the leadership, when they hear Haggai telling these words, imagine their thoughts as they're thinking, oh, wow, I haven't led right. You see, the people aren't profiting from their labors. They're working hard, but they have so little to show for it. Look at that last line, that verse 6 line. It says, the wage earner puts his wages in a bag with a hole in it. I feel that, church. Am I the only one? How many times have you said, whew, I finally paid off that bill, finally paid off that debt. Now I'm going to have a little bit. I can put a little bit more in the savings. Man, we're going to be good now. And then you look at your bank account and, whomp, whomp. <laughs> that stinks, don't it? Where is it all gone? The problem is this time we invest in what's needed Back in Deuteronomy chapter 28, most of this chapter deals with what's happening when the people aren't following God and not giving God what he deserves. They're just giving lip service. Oh, we love God, but they're not doing anything about it. Oh, we love God. They're not serving him. In verses 28 and 29, it says, The Lord will afflict you with madness, blindness, and mental confusion so that at noon you will grope as a blind person gropes in the dark. You will not be successful in anything you do. You will only be oppressed and robbed continually and no one will help you. The people are not prospering, even in Haggai, and they don't know why. They can't figure out why life is not going right. Remember, we're talking about God's people here, church. We really need to focus this. We're talking about God's people here. We're not talking about the rest of the world. God disciplines those he loves like a father, his children. The book of Hebrews is my favorite book in the Bible. Chapter 12, verse 7 says, God is dealing with you as sons, for what son is there that a father does not discipline? The rest of the world prospering is of no concern. Doesn't matter one bit. Knowing and doing the will of God is our concern. Consider now the hardships and the lack of prosperity the people we're experiencing. God asked them again in verses 7 and 8. The Lord of armies says this, think carefully about your ways. Again, man, that's like a third time already. Think carefully about your ways. Go up into the hills, bring down lumber, and build the house, and I'll be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. Now God gets direct. 
Beating around the bush didn't help. He's got to be direct with them. This is what I need you to do. Here's what you're to do. Build my house first. God's glory comes first. We're to look at God and be in his will. God provides all we need, but we have got to put God first in all things. So here's a question that uh, we really need. The question becomes quickly becomes this. Who or what are we seeking? Who or what are we seeking? Are we seeking fame and fortune? Are we seeking a comfortable life? Are we seeking games, concerts, toys, retirement? Are we, can see, are we seeking just to fill the place up with a ton of people? Are we seeking just to make sure we keep everybody happy and content? We don't want to upset those people because those people give a lot of money. We want to make sure we're doing what they want us to do. Mm. How much time have we spent this past week on ourself? How much time... Have we spent this past week serving God? How much have you invested in your own home versus how much have you invested in this family of God? We've become a culture obsessed with our entertainment and our pleasure. Paul tells young Timothy about this uh, and the end of times uh, when there will be those who are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That describes America. Lovers of pleasure, way before we're lovers of God. Oh, whoa, whoa, preacher, I love God. Does your life say that? Sounds like society today, don't it? Haggai verse 9 in chapter 1 says, You expected much, but then it amounted to little. When you brought the harvest to your house, I ruined it. Why? This is the declaration of the Lord of armies, because my house still lies in ruins while each of you is busy with your own house oh how distracted we become we've forgotten that jesus calls us to be the good needed not to sit back not to make judgments not to look out only for ourselves and here's the crazy part about it all you ready for this church this is the what really baffles my mind at times god makes me feel guilty he really irritates me and annoys me with messages like this but then i had no in the back of my mind you know what's crazy cameron is god doesn't need you God doesn't need any of my money. God doesn't need any of my time. God doesn't need anything that I have to offer. However, he wants me. You know, there's a difference between being needed and being wanted. And too often I feel like I'm needed, but not wanted. God wants me. God desires that I want him. God desires that I show him my heart and that I give him all that he desires from my life. He desires we focus on him and reach the lost instead of building up our own personal treasury and getting what we want. What does God desire? One word. You ready? What does God desire? You. What do I have that God could possibly need? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. But we give because God wants us to bless, be blessings. He gives because God wants to bless us. But when we withhold from God, striving to meet our needs first, we fail to give God his glory that is his and his alone. Look at verses 10 and 11 of chapter 1 again. It says, so on your account, the skies have withheld the dew and the land its crops. I have summoned to drought on the fields and on the hills, on the grain, new wine, fresh oil, and whatever the ground yields, on people and animals and all that your hands produce. As a parent, I get this. As a parent, I truly get this. I remember learning as a kid when I was growing up, I heard of maybe one or two friends of mine or people I went to school with, they got this thing called an allowance. That baffled me. Wait, your parents just give you money? Every week your parents just give you a certain amount of money? Are you serious? I was My allowance, as you all have heard comedians joke about this for years, my allowance was I was allowed to sleep in that house. I was allowed to put whatever food Ann Bailey or Dennis Bailey put on that table. My dad one time made hot dogs and milk gravy. We came in, Mark, Mom, and I came in from doing something. Dad had the day off for whatever reason, and we walk in. Dad put a big old bowl on the table with hot dogs sticking out of milk gravy. And it sounds as gross as it looked. 
and we're laughing, and my dad has had the same prayer for years. I mean, it's, he says it so fast, we struggle to know the words, but I'm not going to do it for you. My dad said the same prayers for you every time, right before the meal. Kind of all the things that you say, blessings, amen. Uh, every time, every time. And all you see is just hot dogs with milk gravy sticking out, and we're giggling. And he, at the end of his prayer that day, said the same fast prayer. The end of his prayer says, and forgive my family for laughing at what you gave. Ooh. I still laughed. <laughs> I'll apologize to God later, but, Dad, this is weird. That was the crunchiest and saltiest thing I've ever eaten all my life. Even my mama, the sweet angel as she is, is sitting there giggling. But see, for those of you who are outside, y'all don't know this. I'm shaking my shoulders. Mama don't make a noise. She just shakes. Like she's getting ready to get dancing or something. Oh, my word. But I knew that my parents provided everything I needed. I was allowed to eat what they put on the table. I was allowed to wear the hand-me-down clothes I got from cousins and other people. I was allowed to sleep in a non-air-conditioned house. And my brother moved out, and my mom and dad bought me bunk beds that blocked the only ceiling fan I had in my room. I was a big boy. I needed some cooler air, and I didn't get it. I was allowed to work and do whatever my parents asked me to do. And I remember telling my kids the exact same thing when they came home. Hey, can I get an allowance? You sure can. I'm allowing you to sleep in that bed. I'm allowing you to enjoy all the things that I'm giving this house. What do you mean an allowance? Come on, you've got to be kidding me. I also know that when my kids wanted something, especially something special that was costly, we made them work for it. You see, it's oh so true that hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times. Society today is facing hard times because we have gotten comfortable. And even this happens in our churches as well. And again, remember that God is talking to his people, not the outside world. Now, in the remainder of this first chapter of Haggai, the people do return to construct the temple. Verse 12 says, then Zerubbabel, awesome name for your child. I'm telling you, call your son Zerubbabel. I'll pay for his college tuition because he'll probably be dead then. It's fine. Uh, verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, son of Sheatiel, the high priest, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, uh, and the entire remnant of the people obeyed the Lord their God and the words of the prophet Haggai uh, because the Lord their God had sent him. So the people feared the Lord. The leaders, the high priest, all the people obeyed the Lord. And notice here they did so. Why? Because they feared the the Lord. That's one thing lacking in American Christian culture, a healthy fear of God. God can bless us, but we continue day after day in pursuit of things that we want. We're not showing the fear he deserves. When, uh, but when people as a whole turn together and perform the work that God has called them to do, he blesses. Verse 13, then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, delivered the Lord's message to the people. I am with you. This is the Lord's declaration. Man, what a comfort that is. God is with us. God's discipline isn't a sign that he ain't there. Rather, it shows his love for us and his desire to draw us back the way he wants us to be, the way he calls us to be. God has called his people right here at Cambridge Christian. God is calling us to stop being comfortable. God is calling us to rebuild and refocus. God is calling us to reach out and help whenever, however needed, without fear and without question. God is calling us to renovate and make better this building, this structure, but way more so, this people. What is God calling you to do? It's time we get our own distractions out of our way. It's time we get focused on what truly matters. It's time we take that legacy that's been given to us, church, to a whole new level. Let's pray. God, you are so awesome, and we don't deserve your goodness. So, Father, we come to you right now humbly and asking you to forgive us when we get distracted and help us focus on what's important. And, God, we can say a resounding amen to that, and we can turn around and not change a thing. So, Father, help us. Help us to get focused. Help us to once again become strong men through the hard times that we have faced. Strong people, a strong church that does what's best, that does what's needed, regardless of what anyone else might say or think. Help us to stand and stand firm. Build us stronger than ever. Help us renovate so much more than this building, but help us renovate your church, your people, 
even more so. We need you. Help us to acknowledge your lead. In the perfect name of Jesus, we cry out. Amen.